Well, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let us get started. Thanks so much for sharing where you're coming from and how much of the studies have you done. We are expecting a few more people to join. We already have a lot of people here on the call. So we're going to make it interactive and we're going to make it fun. And we'll be using this poll today to for me to ask you certain questions so that I know how you're doing. But we also have a chat function. So if you have any questions, any immediate questions, then please throw them in the chat box. If you have questions that you wish that we answer at some point throughout this workshop, then put them in a Q&A box. We're going to have a special guest at the end of our seminar tonight who is going to share with you tips and strategies on preparing a winning MBA application. So if you have any questions about the MBA applications as well, please put them in a Q&A box. But today is really all about the verbal section of the GMAT. And I've noticed that many of you mentioned that you're just kind of getting started. So when I speak with our clients that are just coming to us for the first time about the verbal section, I usually actually ask them, what sections do you think are there on the GMAT? And I would very often hear there's a math section and there's an English section. Well, we'll get to this in a moment. I'll actually show you that it's not exactly what most people think. But when it comes to the verbal section specifically, the one interesting thing that you would notice that it isn't really about knowing English. And perhaps just to break the ice a little bit, I wanna give you a really quick lesson in French and we'll test whether the chat function works as well. Does anybody know what would be in French to take? If you can throw it in the chat box, just type it in that little chat box. There should be a button chat. And you can keep it open. We're going to interact that way. What do you think? Does anybody speak French? What's, French, what's the French word for take? OK, yes, uh, Martin is saying it's prendre. And uh, yeah, and Moise, uh, so thank you. Thank you. A few people are saying prendre. And what is the French for to learn? What's, what's the French? Yeah, it's exactly, it's apprendre. So see, in the French language, to learn and to take have the same roots. That means that learning is really yours to take. And I would want you to take as much as you possibly can in these two hours that we're going to spend together. And hopefully we can continue working together. And in these two hours, just take as much as you want. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is grab a pen and paper, take some notes, especially because we are going to be looking at some real GMAT questions. And you would ac actually want to take notes just so that you can, first of all, take notice of, your, of a few strategies we're going to talk about tonight. And secondly, that you actually be taking some notes about the questions so that you can answer these questions. So let's do a real GMAT question, just so that we know what is it that we're getting ourselves into. This is going to be a critical reasoning question. We'll do it step by step. I'm going to give you some time to read the question. Then I'm going to give you some time to read the answer choices. You have a choice. So we'll all vote on what you think is the right answer. And then we'll talk about this question. So here's the question. You can have about 45 seconds to try to make sense of it. All right, in about 45 seconds. And 
this is not particularly a complicated passage. So what I'd like to do now is let me know in the chat box if you're comfortable with the passage, if you've read it at least once. And maybe, you know, let me know. Okay, yes. So everybody's saying yes. Okay, perfect. So now I'd like to show you the answer choices. And I'm going to give you another 45 seconds or so to look through the answer choices and pick the one that you think most closely matching the question. Essentially, what do you think is the right answer? So here are the answer choices. And you can vote for your favorite answer here in the poll. All right, so this is about how much time you will have on a real test, but just in case you, I've noticed many people still haven't chosen the answer. So I'm gonna give you another 15 seconds. Just choose whatever you think is right. Doesn't really matter. This is not an exam. If you get the question in correctly, then we just gonna learn something. Another five seconds. And that's, it. Let me end the poll and let me actually share with you what everybody has selected. Uh, full transparency, as you could see, um, about half of the people voted for D and uh, slightly fewer for E and also a good number of people voted for C. So uh, let's see. Let's see what is the right answer. Now, by the way, D and E, traditionally, as I'm doing this question in the class, are the most popular answer. So you, whatever you selected is actually what's very popular. So let's see, let's go back to the passage. Now, the passage itself isn't particularly super hard to understand. Right? All of you are very comfortable with this passage. And essentially, there's Sasha who is talking about our human evolution and about what these people ate. And then Jamal is trying to say, well, you know, whatever applied to these prehistoric people doesn't really apply to people today because they're not as physically active. They didn't really have to hunt for these animals. So that's basically what he's trying to say. Now, we don't really have to be experts in anthropology, especially because there isn't really very much about anthropology in the answer choices. Now, the question was, what is Jamal doing? It wasn't about what exactly how this evolution worked. It was what is Jamal doing? So when we read the answer choices, and by the way, I did mention that the passage itself isn't particularly complicated. But what I didn't mention, that's probably something you have noticed, is that the question, the answer choices rather, are quite confusing. So this is an example of a question where the answer choices are much more confusing than the passage itself. Sometimes it's the other way around. So if we're looking at the answer choices, you would notice that there isn't really anything that requires that we know anything about anthropology or human evolution. Rather, we would need to pay attention to certain types of words that describe what is Jamal doing. And these would be words such as refuting or qualify or support and broaden or an assumption and a conclusion or expressing a doubt. So what exactly is Jamal doing? Well, I mean, technically he can do all of these things. By the way, this is a 700 level question on the GMAT. So we really need to be careful about understanding these keywords. And this kind of brings us to an important point is that the GMAT could give us passages about anything 
But we don't need to know any jargon about human evolution or anything else like that. But we do need to understand what some of these words mean. And even though the GMI does not actually test vocabulary directly, some of the keywords that signal to us the structure of an argument is what we need to understand. Now, it's actually not particularly hard. So let's go through them. What does it mean refuting? Well, that means that he's trying to say that whatever she said was wrong. Is he trying to say that whatever she said about the prehistoric ancestors was wrong? Hmm, not really. He didn't say that. He just said that our people today maybe shouldn't really necessarily eat what people ate before. That's what he's trying to say. Uh, now, he, how about B? He's saying that he is qualifying her conclusion. Now, what does it mean qualify? This word, by the way, appears quite often on the GMAT, and that's why you don't really need the very sophisticated vocabulary. You just have to look for patterns. So qualify, okay, we'll get back to this. We'll see what qualify exactly means. And then in C, he's talking about supporting and broadening her additional evidence or conclusion. Hmm, okay, we'll get back to this. You know, what does it actually mean to broaden something, broaden the conclusion? Oh, well, let's see. Let's maybe see if we can eliminate some of the other answer choices. Now, D says he's questioning whether her assumption about our prehistoric ancestors permits any conclusion about human evolution. Hmm, well, that's interesting because here specifically, we're talking about the word assumption, and then we talk about the word conclusion, about the evolution. Well, first of all, she didn't really particularly make any assumptions. She said things specifically about people that lived before. Secondly, even if we didn't pick that part up, she wasn't particularly talking about the human evolution. She was just saying that people in the past have this sort of a diet, and that's why this diet is healthy. Right? So there wasn't really any conclusion about the evolution itself, and that's why D is not correct. And now if we look at E, which is expressing doubts about whether most human beings today are as healthy as our prehistoric ancestors were. Well, sometimes in our classes, E would actually be a popular answer here today, it's slightly less popular than D. But this is a very clever trap because he was saying that most human beings today are less physically active. In E, we are reading that most human beings today are as healthy as our prehistoric ancestors. So in our mind, we assume that these two things mean the same, that being less physically active means being less healthy. I mean. Look at the life expectancy. 100,000 years ago, people lived 20, 30 years. Now they lived 80 to 90 to 100 years. So we certainly couldn't say or equate these two things. Now we're making our own assumptions. And he, by the way, did not actually express a doubt whether they're more healthy. He was just saying that they're less physically active. And even that, the ultimate goal was to talk about the diet, remember? not just about saying that they're less healthy. Hmm. Okay, so now we're down to two answer choices, B and C. B says he should qualify her conclusion and C says he should broaden it. By the way, these two words are the opposites of each other. Qualify means I wanna narrow something down. Broaden means I wanna broaden it up. So if I talk about, let's say a group of people, say I talk, that everybody in Toronto, everybody who lives in Toronto loves dogs. I, for example, I could say this. Now, this is probably going to be a very broad statement. So I would need to qualify it and just maybe say everybody in Toronto on my street who is in, within this age group, you know, they love dogs. So I'm qualifying means I'm narrowing it. And if I want to broaden it, maybe I'm going to say, well, not just everybody in Toronto, but maybe everybody in Ontario, right? So if the statement is too broad, I want to qualify it. If it's too narrow, I want to broaden it. 
what is he trying to do? Is he trying to broaden the statement or is he trying to narrow it? What do you think? Exactly. He is trying to narrow it because he is saying, look, whatever you said before doesn't maybe necessarily apply to everyone because people are not as physically active. That's why we have to qualify. Maybe that diet is good for some people, but not for everyone. And that's why B is actually the right answer. Huh. So what can we learn from this? Well, a couple of things. First of all, of course, we don't need to know anything about human evolution to do the GMAT, but we need to pay attention to certain very specific things and we need to be very structured in the way that we approach the questions. In fact, don't take my words for it. Let's ask people who make the test, what separates people who get 500 from 700 plus scores? And here's what they're gonna say. They're gonna say, look, we can give you passages about anything, but the GMAT is not a test of subject matter. So you don't really need to know any of the jargon, only any of the technical terminology. And that is why it's unlike almost any other test we've ever done. Instead, the GMAT exam measures higher order reasoning skills. Now, most of the exams, by the way, that we've ever done in our life were measuring our memory. So you memorize, let's say, biology, you show up at the exam, you talk about biology, maybe then you forget. But the GMAT is the test of skills because this is what's going to be necessary to help you succeed in a business school. And they're gonna be skills such as, how well are you making decisions? You know, if we're looking at two answer choices and we're not quite sure, well, maybe sometimes we just need to trust our guts. Maybe we just need to make a decision. Maybe we need to go forward. Maybe we need to manage our time. That's important. So the whole exam experience is designed to give you little challenges that ask you to demonstrate how well you can show the skills that will be helpful in a business school as well as in a 21st century workplace. By the way, this quote is directly from the GMAT. The GMAT is an organization that makes, makes the test and it was actually created as a not-for-profit organization by the business school. So the business schools are their member business schools that essentially govern what this organization does. That's why whatever they design, the exam that they make is the exam that meets the needs of the business schools in terms of helping them select the best candidates. So for the GMAT, in case you're wondering, you do need to have a little bit of knowledge, things such as geometry, algebra, statistics, and some basic English language rules. And we'll go through the English language rules that, or at least the most important ones that you need to know tonight. But Whatever you need to know doesn't go beyond high school. In fact, most of it is from the middle school. And there's even some stuff from the elementary school. But it, of course, doesn't mean that any middle school student would be able to do well on the GMAT. Because again, it's all about your know, reasoning skills. Now, and that should really make sense because even though we've been told in the past, maybe by some of our teachers, that knowledge is power, that mantra doesn't work anymore because now we have Google and we have libraries. And anytime we want to know something, we can just Google it. We don't even need a library card. You know, but if that's all that we needed, then everybody in the world will be very successful, will be multimillionaires because if you want to learn how to become a multi-billionaire, all you need to do is read a book on how to become a multi-billionaire then of course, life would be easy. Unfortunately, not that easy. We need the right skills. We need to know how to apply them. We need to sometimes break some of our old habits. And even, let's look at the structure of the test. We talked about the structure of the test at the beginning of this seminar, and we talked about the, the math section and the English section, right? Well, let's look at the structure of the test. There is no word math. There is no word English, but, there are words such as analytical, and there are words such as reasoning. Now, today we talk primarily about the verbal reasoning, which essentially means it's reasoning with English text. It's reasoning without numbers. Quantitative reasoning is reasoning with numbers. So if you are curious about the quantitative reasoning section, if you haven't been to our master refresher class, it's in approximately two weeks on September 28th. 
12 days actually. So the quantitative reason and the verbal reason sections are the sections that take up the most time on the test. So it's about a three hour long exam with breaks, it's about three and a half hours. And the quantitative and the verbal reason take up about two hours of that exam. And these two sections would actually then contribute towards the total score, 200 to 800. The other two sections do not. The schools still see your score, even with the essay, they'll even be able to read your essay. But these scores, 0 to 6 and 1 to 8, do not actually count towards the 200 to 800. Now, to make things more interesting for you on the test, and to make it actually easier for the GMAT to precisely assess what is your level, the GMAT is using what's called the computer adaptive algorithm. What this means is instead of giving you hundreds of questions, many of them easy, some medium, some hard, and you know, maybe wasting your time on some of the easier questions or maybe giving you very hard questions that you're not prepared to deal with, they would instead use this algorithm, which will change the difficulty of the questions as you go along. So every person who goes for the exam is going to see a different set of questions. Some people will see a lot of easy questions, some people see a lot of hard questions, some see people see a lot of medium questions, and that is all selected based on how you do. So let me ask you a question, just maybe answer in a chat box. When you go for the GMAT, would you like to see a lot of easy questions, a lot of medium questions, or a lot of hard questions? What would you like to see on the test? What do you think? Yeah, most people are saying I want to see medium questions or hard questions because the difficulty of the questions determines your score. If you want a high score, you got to deal with hard questions. And people who see a lot of easy questions, they will unfortunately get low scores. Now, dealing with hard questions, of course, is more challenging and we don't get more time for hard questions. And that is why we need to be prepared. You know, you can think of the GMAT as, I'm gonna use a few analogies all throughout the workshop, but you can think of preparing for the GMAT as kind of like training for a marathon. If I decide to train to run 42 kilometers, it's gonna be very different than running two kilometers. I, my training is going to be different and I'm gonna be doing different things. That's why the preparation for the GMAT is probably gonna be very different from what you've done before. It's gonna be a lot of stamina, a lot of learning strategies and a lot of practice. And I'll actually break it down for you so that you can see how you can actually do this. I'll share a few resources with you towards the end of the seminar because I noticed in the poll you mentioned, many of you mentioned, I need to know what books to use, what resources to use. Now in the quant and verbal sections, as I'm sure you probably know, there are different types of questions. Today, we're talking about these three types of questions. The one that we've already seen is called the critical reasoning question. We will talk about sense correction and reading comprehension. And the one you're going to see on September 28th is problem solving and data sufficiency. So let's talk about these three types of questions, sense correction, critical reasoning, and reading comprehension. You're going to see them all mixed up throughout the 65 minutes of your verbal reasoning section. And there's a total of 36 questions. That gives you less than two minutes per question. So every single question that we're going to be doing today is going to be from one of the past exams and you always have less than two minutes per question. So please keep that in mind. That actually brings me to an important question that I wanted to ask you. Why do you think is the GMAT verbal challenging? What's challenging about it? And perhaps, again, just to make things easy, let me launch a real quick poll and you can pick your favorite answer. What do you think makes the verbal hard? And I'll give you some of these things that I see here. And then we'll talk about each of these three types of questions. Well, from what I see um, here so far, uh, English is not my first language. So that's a very popular answer so far. What's to read and not enough time? Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, several answer choices work right. That's a very common problem because the GMA designs answer choices to be confusing. That's why there's several strategies that you can take to actually be less confused. 
with the answer choices, there are several strategies. You can be a little more proactive. You know, what we teach you in a class is how to actually work with the answer choices so that you know exactly what to look for, as opposed to try to get distracted by all of these answer choices. By the way, just for full disclosure, the GMAT calls the wrong answers distractors. That means they're there to simply distract you, you know, not just there at random. So you are absolutely right. If the answer choices look right, that is there on purpose. Uh, many answer choices sometimes seem subjective. Uh, by the way, if we think that they're subjective, that means that we just don't know exactly what the GMAT prefers to see, right? especially in sentence correction. So there's a, deal, there's a way to deal with subjectivity as well. So these are all really, really good reasons. And uh, one of the other reasons is that if you're doing the verbal section last on the GMAT, which is possible to do, then uh, you might be really, really tired by the time that you get to the verbal section. You've been there for three hours and you see all of a sudden a really complicated passage about molecular biology. Sounds like fun. So let's talk about how do we conquer this GMAT. Let's talk about sentence correction. Now, what do we actually correct in a sentence? If anybody can please answer in the chat box, what is it that we want to correct in a sentence? Yeah, a few people are saying grammar. Uh, some people are saying spelling, punctuation. So there are actually three things that the GMAT would test. The grammar, which by the way means the structure of a sentence. So we're talking about how do we arrange the words that's all about grammar. Then the GMAT is also testing meaning, which means that whenever we see a sentence, it has to convey the meaning that we want to say in a clear, unambiguous way. And we're also talking about the style, which means if we can say something in one word, why use five words? In the business world, it's all about being clear and concise. I mean, imagine if we are reading a contract that's worth millions of dollars. One word or you know, one sentence can mean easily tens of millions of dollars for a company. So we got to really pay a lot of attention to detail. And that's why these things are very important. Now, these are all excellent answers. And when you look at this, you're thinking, OK, well, there are many stylistic rules. Uh, the meaning, OK, I can kind of get it that the meaning has to be clear and, cons and uh, understandable. The grammar, honestly, in the English language, there's so many different grammar rules just because English isn't a pure language. It's a language that was created out of a hodgepodge of many other languages. And that is why for almost every rule, we have an exception, right? We say children, not childs, right? For example, that's a very simple example because a child is actually from a different language. So how do we navigate all of these grammar rules? Well, here's the good news is the GMAT knows this. And they're not out there to try to catch anyone on some very sophisticated grammar rules. So the number of rules that will actually test on the GMAT is very small. In fact, fewer than 10 grammar rules make up over 80% of all questions. So if we know these grammar rules, and obviously when you're putting in the effort into studying, where do you want to put your efforts, right? It's all about efficiency. That's why when a lot of people, when they study for the GMAT, it's really, really important to have the right structure. So you put in your efforts into what's really important and don't get distracted by what's not important. There's billions of different posts about the GMAT and, and the majority of them are not super helpful, but there's things that are really helpful and we'll talk about them. So let's actually talk about grammar. Let's talk about the basic structure of an English sentence, because this is very important. And this is one of the most important rules that's tested on the GMA. And in the most basic form, an English sentence must contain two words as a minimum, actually two parts of the sentence. Does anybody know what are the two words that an English sentence must contain if this is a sentence that describes something? 
sentence is what's called the descriptive mood, which is what the majority of the sentences are going to be on the Gmail. So what, the, what are the two words that this sort of a sentence should have? If you know the answer, just please put it in the chat box. All right, I see a few comments. So the first is a subject. Subject is what or whom the sentence is about. And the second is a verb. That is what is the subject doing. And whenever you see in a sentence, you need to make sure that there's a subject and there's a verb. If one of them is missing, this is called a sentence fragment. Gmart loves to do that sometimes. So they will do something like, Sergey is reading a book, that's a full sentence. Or they can do something like Sergey reading a book. While it's no longer a full sentence, it's now becoming a sentence fragment. When the sentence is long, sometimes it's hard to pick that up. So that's why attention to detail is really, really important. Now, having a subject and a verb is important, but there's another very important rule about the subject and the verb, and that is they must agree with each other. So how do they actually agree? What does this mean the subject and the verb must agree? Well, here's literally what this means. Singular subjects need singular verbs and plural subjects need plural verbs. That is really it. That's as simple as it is. We say a child plays, but children play. Very straightforward. So why don't we see if we are comfortable using this rule? Singular subjects always have a singular verb and plural subjects have plural verbs. I'm going to give you five sentences and I will ask you to pick the correct verb for each of the subjects. You hear the five sentences, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm going to launch a very quick poll. And of course, we'll talk about these sentences in just a minute. All right, I see most of you have answered this already. If you haven't, I'm gonna give you five more seconds and then we'll talk about this. I'm actually gonna share the answers with you just to make it more fun. All right, let me end the poll right now and let me share the results with you. So as you could see in the first sentence, the crowd was aware cheering the Raptors. Most of the people have selected was cheering. Some people said were cheering. Well, the Raptors, by the way, is a basketball team from Toronto that in 2019 won the NBA championship for the first time in history. Canadian team won the NBA championship. The crowd on the streets of Toronto was 2 million people that went out on a Monday to celebrate the Raptors win. 2 million people. One crowd that was cheering the Raptors. So when we talk about these collective nouns that describe groups of people, groups of animals, groups of objects, as long as it's one group, then we use singular because we don't necessarily talk about each person in the crowd, we talk about the whole crowd. Now, sometimes we talk about crowds and in that case, it will of course be plural. Number two. Amy and Bobby live or lives in Boston. Well, most people said live, a few people said lives. Who lives in Boston? 
Hmm. Amy and Bobby. How many people live in Boston? Two people. Two is more than one. It's plural. That's why we need to say live in Boston. Let's keep going. Jason, as well as his two friends, takes or take a GMAT prep course. How many people take or takes a GMAT prep course? That's a really good question. Because when we talk about Amy and Bobby, we know it's two people. When we say Jason, as well as his two friends, as well as is not the same as and, as well as is extra information. In fact, in the English language, the only word that could be used to create a list that results in a plural verb is the word and. We can say Amy and Bobby, Amy, Bobby, and Charlie. There is no word in the English language that can substitute for and. It's a unique word, very strange. As well as is not the same as and, even though we very often use it as and. So that is why the subject here isn't Jason as well as his two friends. The subject could be Jason or the two friends. And I think it's quite obvious to see that it's Jason because as well as his two friends is actually what's called the modifier phrase. It's simply describing Jason. Normally it would be separated by commas, but it doesn't have to be. What's important here is that the subject is just one of them and it is Jason. And because Jason is one person, Jason takes a GMAT prep course. I know that sounds terrible, but grammatically, that's correct. All right, let's keep going. The next is even more interesting. Neither her brothers nor Susan has or have ever been to China. Most people said have. The right answer is actually has. This is a different rule because there is no list, there is no word, and instead we have the or. So it's either brothers or Susan or neither brothers nor Susan. Grammatically, it means the same thing. Obviously, it means a different thing, but grammatically, it is the same. What this means is that it's technically, it's either brothers or Susan that have been to China. And if it were brothers, then we should have used have. And if it were Susan, we should have used has. But because we're using or, we don't actually know who's been to China. Could be either of them. And because of that, there's some uncertainty about what verb should we really use. And that is why there is a rule. And the rule is the rule that I've never learned in school. And it's a very strange rule. And the rule says that if you have this sort of a structure that's either or, or either or, or neither nor, then if we're not sure if one of these subjects, potential subjects is plural and one of them is singular, we should match the verb with whatever subject is closest to that verb. So what is closer here in this sentence? Well, it's Susan. And that's why the right answer is has. Neither her brothers nor Susan has ever been to China. I know it sounds terrible, but it's grammatically correct. This also means, by the way, that with this rule, we have to be very careful because if we were to say neither Susan nor her brothers, we need to use have. So there isn't one verb that must be used in this sentence. We can actually use either of these two verbs depending on how we structure that or combination of the subjects. Really weird, right? But that's actually what you need to know for the test. Let's go to number five. The board of directors has or have decided and the votes have almost even the split as you could see here. So technically who decided to fire the CEO? Well, of course it's the people. The board, you know, how can a board decide something? It's the people. And that's why most of the people, when they're saying something like the board of directors, they would say, yeah, the board of directors have decided because they automatically think it's the directors who have decided. But in this specific example, the right answer is 
actually also has, it is the board that has decided. I will show you in just a couple of moments why it's the board and not the directors. And you'll remember that rule because especially if you made the mistake, you're like, I know I feel really strange right now. How can I make this mistake? So now I'm ready to absorb this and now I will know exactly how not to in the future. So let me show you specifically for number five, how could we determine which one is a subject? Because it could be the board, could be the directors, right? But we need some sort of a rule, we need a way. So here's what we need to know. First of all, when you are seeing a sentence, not every noun in a sentence is a subject. Now what's a noun, by the way? That's a person, a place, or a thing. But a noun that does something in a sentence is called a subject. A noun that doesn't do anything in a sentence is called an object. And essentially, it's the noun that has a verb has, is a subject. The noun that doesn't have a verb is an object. So if I say, Sergey is reading a book. Now, who is performing the action? It's Sergey. Sergey is reading. Is reading is a verb. And the book is an object because the book isn't actually doing anything. Right? And then if we look at the same sentence as a passive voice. So if I were to say the book is being read by Sergey. Well, now Sergey is actually an object because the book is what? Is being read. So the book is a subject, is being read, is a verb. So that's how you de can determine what's the subject and what's the, what's the object. What is actually doing the action? Now you might say, well, wait a second. We just talked about the board of directors. How do I know whether it's the board or the directors that are doing the action? Well, there's a really helpful rule that we're getting to. And that helpful rule is this. If you see a preposition in a sentence, the preposition will always be before an object. It'll never be before a subject. So what are the prepositions? The prepositions are these very short words that connect the nouns together. So if we're saying the board of directors, that little word of is actually really important. It's a preposition that tells us that whatever is coming right after it has to be an object. By the way, there are no exceptions to this rule in the English language. So the word before it has to be in this example, has to be a subject. Now, this rule is extremely useful because if you have a long sentence with a bunch of different nouns and you're trying to decide what noun exactly is a subject, one of the first things you wanna do is get rid of all of the nouns that are after a preposition and just deal with a very small number that are not. So very, very useful. Now, so far we talked about what's called the subject verb agreement. The subject and the verb must agree in a number, plural or singular. However, there is another instance of an agreement rule on the GMAT, and that is agreement with pronouns. So what does it mean? Well, the pronoun, you may remember from school is a very short word such as he or she or it or they that replaces nouns in a sentence. Now, whenever we are replacing something, essentially we could have said, Sergey is reading a book because Sergey likes reading, or we could say Sergey is reading a book because he likes reading. Now, whenever we are replacing one word and plugging in a different word, we need to make sure that the word we're sticking in there is the right word. What if we pick the wrong word? And that's exactly what you need to pay attention to. When it comes to pronouns, there are two things we need to be careful about. Number one is that we know that that pronoun refers to a very specific noun. And number two, it actually agrees with it. Let me give you an example. And I'd love for you to please participate in a chat box. Please let me know in this sentence whether the pronoun she is used properly. And if he, no, then why not? 
please let me know. Is it used properly, yes or no? If no, then why not? Okay, if you were saying no, some people are saying yes. All right, yeah, Martin is saying, because I cannot tell whether it was Melissa or Elizabeth who was feeling unwell. You're absolutely right. Even though Elizabeth is in the hospital and Melissa is visiting her, well, how do we know whether maybe Elizabeth is a doctor and Melissa is visiting her, or maybe Elizabeth is feeling unwell in the hospital? That's why in this specific sentence, we need to be more clear. She could be either of them too. Now, sometimes logically we think, well, it's got to be Elizabeth, right? But we don't know for sure. That's why we need to make, not make our own assumptions. Let me give you another example. I love shopping at Walmart because they have good prices. What do you think? Is the pronoun here used properly? If yes, why yes? If no, why not? Okay, a few people, a few more people are saying yes this time. Yeah, 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 everybody's saying yes so far. Okay, well, look, who is they? Let me know in the chat box, who is they? Hmm. It's a Walmart, right? I mean, Walmart is, I mean, it's a huge company. It's, you know, it's their workers, it's their stores, it's, you know, it's it's them. You know, I, I love going to Walmart. They're so nice. They have good prices. That's how we speak every day. But technically, if we look at this sentence from a grammar perspective, Walmart's a company. And it's one company. So we're not talking about Walmart workers. We don't have about talking about, we're not talking about Walmart stores. We're talking about Walmart. And Walmart is one company. So if we want this sentence to be grammatically correct, we should say a lot shopping at Walmart because it has good prices. Who sounds terrible. Nobody would speak like that. But grammatically, that's correct. And by the way, the GMAT loves to play these tricks, especially when, when they talk about it versus they. They love this with the names of the companies and with the species of animals. They love that. All right. What I'd like to do now is actually see if we learn something. So it's going to be a little quiz time. And again, feel free to participate so that you can actually learn even more. It's all learning by doing, right? You learn the strategy, then you do it. That's what we do in our class, is we teach you something, then we get you to practice, talk about it, see what works, what doesn't work, and then just keep reinforcing good habits. That's very, very important. So let's take a look at this question. I'm, give you, I'm going to give you about a minute and a half or so. That's how much time you normally would have for this sort of a question on the GMAT. And uh, I'm going to launch a poll so that you can actually share what you think is the right answer. So there you go. You have about a minute and a half. Oops. There we go.
believe it or not, it has been a full two minutes. And I see that many people still haven't chosen the answer. So please choose whatever you think is the right answer right now. Doesn't really matter if it is actually right. Makes no difference. There are no right and wrong answers here in this class. They're only the answers we can learn from. So thank you so much. I see most of the people have now voted. And let me end the poll and show you what we have selected. So the results are in, ladies and gentlemen. And here we go. C is the most popular answer, followed by E. And then we got B, A, and D as the least popular answer. Huh. Let's see. Let's talk about this question. And if anybody can volunteer to throw your answer in the chat box, why did you choose a specific answer? Maybe anybody who chose C, and most of the people did. Why specifically C? What was it in the C that you said, that's good, I like it, I should choose it? So let me know in the chat box. And in the meantime, here's what I want to share with you how the reasoning usually works with many people. So they're going to look at this and say, OK. One of the things that I can notice is that in some answer choices, the GMAT talks about swaths. And in some answer choices, the GMAT talks about the swaths. So it looks like, yeah, some of the people are saying just kind of explains it better. It's just a better option. Somebody is saying it's you know parallel reasoning. Okay, so that's good. Thanks so much for sharing. So we'll see. Let's 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 get to this in a moment, and uh, we'll see if we can use this way of reasoning to actually arrive at the right answer. So, swaths or the swaths? Hmm. Well, I mean, technically, how many animals are there in the Amazon in South America? Well, probably a lot. So, could we really talk about the swaths? Or should we talk about many swaths? Well, if we use this reasoning, then we'll fall into a trap. Because remember, we just said that sometimes the GMAT refers to the species of the animals and not the actual animals. So it's actually a very common way to refer to animals is by their species. So it's completely OK from the logical perspective to just say the swaths. So that's OK. So we can't really use that logic. And especially, we don't, we're not really supposed to know anything about animals. So what else can we use? Well, we could say, OK, well, um, I need to decide whether I will use a plural or a singular subject. So maybe looking at the verb would help, because we know the subject verb agreement rule. Well, let's look at the verbs. So in A, we have swas hang. In B, we say swas hang. In C, we say swas use. In D, we say swas hangs. And in E, we say the swath hangs. Not very hopeful, right? Because all five do use the subject verb agreement correctly. So we can't use that. Well, how else could we decide whether we need to use a plural or a single subject? Would it be maybe really helpful if we had a pronoun? Because if the subject verb agreement doesn't work, then we have another agreement rule with the pronouns. You know, it would be so nice to have a pronoun, right? Oh, wait. Oh, there is a pronoun. In fact, it's there twice. Look to the very end of this sentence. Grow on its coat and between its toes. The little three character word was all that we were looking for. And because we're talking about its code, could we really talk about swaths? It's its code, so it's got to be the swaths. And by the way, its is not underlined, so we know it has to stay as is. So that is why, for that only one reason, three answer choices are gone right away. Cannot you have, say, the swaths, its? or swaths, it has to be one. All right, so now we're down to two answer choices. And most people at this point chose E was the second most popular answer because E, most people are gonna look at this and say, it hangs or it hangs, sleeps and moves. That's what we call the parallel structure of a sentence. And uh, you'll learn this in, in our program. 
It's a very basic structure of the English sentence. Is whenever we have a list, we need to list things in the same grammatical form. And it would have been the right answer if it was actually following the proper grammatical form. Because if it simply said, it thinks, sleeps, and moves, then E would have been correct. But it says, it thinks, sleeps, and it moves. Now, that little word, it, was all that we needed to see because it breaks the parallel structure. All of a sudden, it's simply, instead of simply listing the actions that the source is doing, we now have at the end the full clause, which is the pronoun and the verb. And that's not what we want to see in a parallel structure. Now, you might look at D and say, well, wait a second. But if we're talking about parallel structure, how about Hank sleeping and moving? Well, there's a very simple explanation for that. Well, there are a couple of explanations. First of all, we found four wrong answers. Only one of them is left. So we don't even need to look at D. It has to be right. There's no such thing as all wrong answers. But secondly, there's actually an explanation for that is because sleeping and moving is simply describing the process how this loss is hanging. And these are called participle modifiers. And this is a slightly more complicated subject. We do spend time in our class to actually talk about it. We'll teach you exactly how to use participle modifiers so that you'll know when they're applicable, when they're not. In this case, it actually was not that important to even understand the participle modifiers or even understand the parallel structure as well. We just had to understand the pronouns. So this question is actually the question about pronouns, even though it didn't look like that originally. And the pronouns are very short words that we need to pay attention to. And that is why, what can we learn from this sentence? Very, very few people got it right, but don't feel bad. You're here to learn. What we can learn is that we can't really choose what sounds right or what looks right or what feels right. In fact, I'm going to give you a, a quote from people who make the test. So we, as the test prep organization, we have a very good relationship with the GMAC, with the people who make the test. And every year before the pandemic, we would go to the headquarters and we would meet these people, we'd share some ideas, uh, we'd spend the day together. And at uh, one of our last events, actually in 2019, one of the last in-person events, now we're doing it virtually, the, there was a person who is actually coming, who is responsible for writing sentence correction question. He was sharing a few things with us and he said, look, please do tell your students that we are not really out there to test grammar. We're there to test their attention to detail, how well they can communicate and how well they can learn how to deal with these questions because these questions are very fast paced. Imagine that you have an average of a minute and 45 seconds per question, but some of these questions are reading comprehension questions. We have a huge passage to read. Uh, we can't really spend as much time on reading comprehension as we do on sentence correction. So we really have just about a minute, maybe a little bit more to deal with these sentence correction questions. So we have to be quick. We have to think on our feet. We have to really pay attention to detail and we have to know what we're doing and practice a lot. That's what's tested. That's what the GMAT's after. Sounds easy? Well, I wish the GMAT were this easy. By the way, of course, I didn't throw this sentence just there for no reason. Please tell me if this sentence is written properly. What do you think? Yes or no? Yeah, most people are saying it should be was this easy because the GMAT is singular. We don't say GMATs, it's one test, right? You might be surprised to learn though, that this sentence is actually written properly. This is a correct sentence. And the reason why it's correct is because of the word wish. Wish means it's not true. So now we're talking about something that's actually hypothetical. This is called the subjunctive mood. This is something that's not commonly tested on the GMA, but you might see maybe one question if you get lucky, that's testing a subjunctive mood. So this is something also that we need to know. 
Remember when you said to someone, I wish I were you, or you know, if I were you, I wouldn't do that. Why would we say if I were you? Because you know, shouldn't we say if I was you or if I am you? But yet we say if I were you. It is because of this subjunctive mood. A very strange rule, but that's why we put basically we use where in this specific example with any subject. Is it all possible to learn? Well, absolutely. In fact, many of you mentioned that I'm worried about the verbal section because English is not my first language. It doesn't have to be. It's my third language. And here's Natasha. She came to our class about five years ago. English was also her third language. It was Portuguese and Spanish first. And nevertheless, she did extremely well in the verbal section. She got 42, which is the top 4% of everybody who does the GMAT better than most people who are native speakers because she really learned the patterns of the test. She learned what to pay attention to. And most importantly, she was really dedicated. That's what, when you come to our class, we would want to make sure that you are dedicated because we can give you the best coaching in the world, but you have to do the test. And that requires a lot of commitment and dedication. And you should be ready to also have fun. Hopefully you're having fun today because the GMAT could be fun if you are making progress, if you're learning new things if you're having the right structure. All of a sudden, all that overwhelm that most people are experiencing on the GMAT, it goes away, and now you see a clear path towards that 700 score. So like I mentioned, and I'm going to give you a few more strategies, but a lot of the things on the GMAT is gonna come down to a lot of practice. Now the practice, we have to be careful with practice because we need to practice what works. I met a lot of people. I personally am so privileged in my 12 year career as a GMAT instructor, I personally worked with over 10,000 people and I met a lot more people. And I met many people who were practicing for years and didn't see results. It's because they were practicing things that don't work. That's why it's important to learn the strategies first. And then you, can, you need to practice. Now, some of you might be coming and say, I've already been studying a lot. I learned a lot of good strategies and I kind of know them, but I'm still getting stuck in my score. And that is why Practice is going to be really important. In fact, we're using a platform here at Admit Master that helps you practice in a very adaptive manner, which means that you can choose exactly what sorts of questions you want to do. The system keeps track of all of your progress and it gives you suggestions on what you need to work on. It's very affordable. It's like about $100 a month and could be even less if you get it for more months. So for three months, it's you know, already less than $100 Canadian and uh, what, what, $80 US. And if you take it for like six months, it's even less than 12 months, it's like 40 bucks a month or something like that. So it's really, really helpful. And if you come and join our live class, then we are going to give it to you for free. By the way, inside this platform, they also strategies. It's not just practice. They also things you can learn. So we do talk about different strategies. We show you how to do different questions and then you practice. This is a kind of a self-study program. You go at your own pace, really, really helpful for a lot of people who've already been studying and are kind of getting stuck and need that boost. It's amazing because just the amount of analytics that it gives you, it's just incredible. You know exactly what to focus on. It saves you so much time and effort. Um, you'll see that when you uh, get access to this platform. By the way, you go to adminmaster.com slash offer and you can try these things for free. And then when you're ready, you can book your seat uh, in this program, you can actually book your access and there's some amazing discounts that we actually give you on this page. So we talked about sentence correction. Let's talk about the other two question types during the time that we have left here together. Now, critical reasoning is the question that we've done first at the start of our class today. And it was really all about the argument. And I wanna ask you, what is an argument really? Because see, most of us, I used to think of an argument as some sort of a disagreement. Sometimes people argue about something. Oh, see, on the GMAT, most of the arguments are going to be arguments made by one person. And I don't know if you ever try to argue with yourself. It's a lot of fun, but there's actually a way to do this. There's a way to create an argument by one person. And that is essentially a logical chain of statements where we have a conclusion, also known as a claim, 
which is essentially a main idea. This is what we're trying to say. Let me give you an example. I attended an awesome GMAT class today, had lots of fun. I do take my preparation seriously and I'm the kind of person who is making the right decisions. Therefore, I will get a high score on the GMAT. So what's my main point? Well, what I really wanna say is I will do well on the GMAT. I will get a high score. But why do I believe this? Oh, because I gave you some evidence also known as a premise. That's a logical, technical term. That's the reason why I believe this statement. And I believe it because I take my preparation seriously and I'm the kind of person who makes the right decisions. I do what's best for me. I make the right decision. I study properly. I get the right structure. And therefore, I will get a high score. That's it. So that's the basic structure of an argument. Any questions so far? Somebody is asking whether you're gonna get a recording. Yes, you will get a recording. You'll actually be able to access it for about seven days. That's how long Zoom will keep the video. So let's actually do a question. Let's do a real question again from one of the past exams. So here is the question. And this time I'm just gonna give you two minutes to do this question, I'll be very quiet. We'll break this question down and I'll ask you, what do you think is the right answer? So let's do it. All right, it has been two minutes. So if you haven't voted yet, then please choose an answer. And in just a moment, we're going to talk about this question. <laughs> All right, let me end the poll right now. And let me actually show you what everybody chose. So as you can see, most people chose B. Fewer people chose C and a few people for A. So let's talk about this question. Now, what are the different ways of doing this question? When, when I show this question in the live class, what I hear a lot from, and unfortunately in this class today, I, I don't see what you're doing. I can kind of imagine what you're doing and I certainly feel for you that you have to go through this question uh, if you were in our 
kind of live virtual class, then we would actually all be on webcams and I'll be able to see you and kind of look you in the eyes and, and answer you some questions. You'll be able to unmute yourself and participate. But here's what we see a lot is that many people are going to be using the way to do this question, which let's call this the sound right way, which is essentially, we're gonna read the passage, we'll read the question, read the answer choices, and we'll try to make sense of this passage. It's a little hard at first to understand what's going on, but we have to keep moving. So we are going to be looking for something that's related to what we're talking about. So what is it that we talked about? We talked about the earthquake, we talked about the AD365, and we talked about the town, the ancient city of Korea on the island of Cyprus. So what is kind of within the scope of this question? Well, A, honestly sounds weird. What does it have to do with our earthquake? B talks about the earthquake, talks about Cyprus, talks about AD365. So it checks all the boxes. So far, that's our favorite choice. If we keep going, all right. So coins, yeah, we talk about Korean, but you know what do coins have to do with it? What do statues have to do with it? How about stone inscriptions? Again, Cyprus 365. Not quite sure, sounds weird. B looks the best. Sometimes we would go back and reread the passage, reread the answer choices, make sure we really don't have a better way of doing this question and just pick B. And it's easy to spend a lot of time on this question just because we don't yet have confidence to know that B is actually the right answer. So how could we gain that confidence? How could we maybe have a better structure of doing this question? Well, perhaps we should learn some rules. And one of the very helpful rules of doing critical reasoning questions is that if we read the question first, we'll know exactly what to look for. So the question says, which of these supports the hypothesis? That tells us this is a strength in question. So we will then read the, the passage, we'll identify the conclusion and the evidence, and we will find the answer choice that strengthens the conclusion. That's gonna be our process. So let's see what answer choice actually would strengthen the conclusion. Now, what is the conclusion, by the way? Well, that's the hypothesis. They hypothesize that the destruction was due to the earthquake. So we are going to be looking for the answer choice that actually says, yeah, we believe this more now because we've read this answer choice. That's essentially what this means in very simple terms. Makes the argument a better argument, more believable argument. So let's see, A, hmm, doesn't seem relevant. Certainly doesn't feel like it strengthens the conclusion. How about B, most, now we believe that this is what happened and most modern history has mentioned that thing. So that definitely tells us that it strengthens the conclusion. How about C, coins again, not sure how it's related statues and stone inscriptions. So now we have a system. Now we know that we actually can go through the process and we know exactly what to work for and we pick B very confidently. We can do this in two minutes. I was paying attention as, as the progression was here in the poll and you know many people were picking B and like, yeah, that's good, confident. We'll do it under a minute. And unfortunately, B is wrong. It's not the right answer. I know you might be very surprised. They actually look so good. So where did things go wrong? What did we miss? And by the way, again, please don't feel bad. We're here to learn. So why is B not right? Let's go back to analyzing this question. Let's do this now the mastery way, which is, we also call it the work smart way, which is really the, the way that you would want to analyze these sorts of questions. And it comes from understanding the strategies it also comes from knowing what to do when you're seeing this question, knowing how to analyze arguments as well. So this is a strength in question. That's beyond any doubt. We're going to then read the passage, identify the conclusion and the evidence, just like what we did before. But then how do we actually strengthen the conclusion? See, the conclusion relies on two things in the argument. It relies on evidence that we know and on the assumptions that we don't know yet. So if we want to strengthen the argument, really the only way to do this is to strengthen our assumption. 
because the evidence is something we already know. There is no reason to strengthen it anymore. But the assumption is something we don't know. So what sort of an assumption is the author making? Well, let's go back and look at the conclusion and the evidence. So the conclusion was the town was destroyed by this earthquake. This is the hypothesis they made. What was the evidence? Well, evidence number one was it looks like the town was destroyed by earthquake, by an earthquake, because there's this debris of collapsed buildings. What else do we know? Well, we also know that there was an earthquake in AD 365 near the island. That was at the very end of that passage. So if we know that the town was destroyed by an earthquake, and we know there was an earthquake in AD 365, what is it that we don't know yet? Well, do we know for sure whether that earthquake destroyed the town? What if there was some other earthquake that destroyed the town? That was really the assumption. So the author is assuming it was that earthquake, not some other. By the way, how did we find this assumption? This finding assumption is a skill. It's a very important skill, especially in critical reasoning, strengthening and weakened questions that are actually the most common questions. It's gonna be critically important to know how to find assumptions. There are different types of assumptions. And actually, when you come to our class, we're gonna teach you exactly how to do this. And we're gonna spend some time so that you can really reinforce those habits. Now, I can tell you that here specifically, this assumption was something that the author was overlooking. The author was overlooking the possibility that there's another explanation. So this is one of the types of the assumptions. So now we're going to be looking at the answer choices and we're gonna be looking for an additional piece of evidence that will tell us it was that earthquake, not some other earthquake. So let's see. Does A help us understand whether it was that earthquake? Not really, it doesn't. How about B? Well, it just tells us there was an earthquake. We already know that. But does it help us understand whether that specific earthquake destroyed the town? No, it doesn't. So that is why B is not the correct answer. Well, let's keep going. Well, maybe C is the right answer. C says that after 365, there were no more coins. And what does this mean? That means that the town was probably destroyed in AD 365. If we put this all together with the fact that it was destroyed by an earthquake and there was an earthquake in the 365, now we're starting to get a complete picture. Now this answer choice actually suggests that probably this is actually a correct ass assumption, that probably this is actually the correct argument. The hypothesis was right. And notice that we don't really know for sure whether this is what happened. It is still possible that there was some other earthquake maybe after it, maybe that specific year, they just stopped minting coins because they just didn't want to mint coins anymore. And a few hundred years later, there was an earthquake that just came in and kind of destroyed the town. It's entirely possible, but that's not our business anymore. We were asked to strengthen the, con the conclusion, not to prove it. So we don't need to be 100% sure we just need to be more sure than we were before. And that is why once we found the answer choice that does that, we can actually stop. We don't even have to read D and E and we can get this question right. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. This was a good exercise to see how to find assumptions and most importantly, uh, what would, do we need to work for and what do we need to not work for when we're looking for the right answer. So again, it's a skill. It's with a lot of practice, with a lot of knowing exactly what to do, how to deal with different types of questions. You are, you definitely can, and you will get really good at this. You just have to be committed to learning these things. So let me finally give you strategies on how you can deal with reading comprehension. And we'll talk about GMAT resources, and then we'll talk about the whole MBA application, because I know the GMAT is just one part of the application. It might be a very important part, but it's just one part. So let me ask you a question. When you are seeing a reading comprehension passage, do you get super excited? Well, that's a rhetorical question. I know the answer is no. Because of course, reading comp passages are really boring. And that is why if we really try to pay attention 
to all of the subject matter, all the jargon in the passages, we are going to get bored out of our mind and we're not going to be able to answer the questions correctly. Instead, we need to pay attention to the things that are going to help us answer the questions. Again, remember attention to detail. But in reading comprehension, it's also understanding the big picture. And I'll show you actually how to do this in a moment. So what we're going to need to do is instead of trying to understand exactly what the author is saying, which will very often be hard, we should instead focus on how the author is making a point. How as opposed to what? Now, this is not how we normally read, because if, if I were to give you a book to read, you will read a book and you will try to understand the subject matter of a book. That's how we've been taught to treat books. We wouldn't look at the book and say, oh, you know, chapter one, here's what they do, here's why they do it, chapter two, here's why they do it. No, we just say, here's what this chapter talks about. But because in the GMAT, we're not supposed to know anything about the subject matter, paying attention to the structure is much more important than paying attention to the subject matter. That's why we're going to be looking for the storyline, the narrative of a story, whenever we are reading. And in fact, there is something. So in our class, we're going to teach you the exact step-by-step -step process. We'll give you all the keywords, and then we'll practice in a class together. So that you're very comfortable with this. You can start this right now. Our next class starts in October. So I know some of you are already registered for our class. So this is something you could begin today. Anytime you pick up an article from a magazine or maybe you pick up a reading comprehension passage from the GMAT book, here's how you're going to go through the process. You're going to say, okay, whenever the author begins talking about something else, maybe they're starting a new par passage or a new paragraph, or maybe they just simply change the train of thought. I will take note. What was the purpose of what they just said? So I'm not necessarily going to say I need to understand everything exactly what they said and what it means. I'm just going to say what was the purpose of what they said? And certainly each paragraph. When I finish the entire passage, I will have sort of an executive summary a very short, concise summary of what the author was doing to organize the passage a certain specific way. And that's what's going to help me answer the questions in the future. I also gonna take note of three important things. Number one, what would be a good title of the passage? What was it really about? That's something what we normally call a scope of a passage. I'm also going to pay attention to how the author is related to that passage. I do want to know this because very often, especially in the reading comprehension, the GMAT is going to ask me to agree or disagree with the author. So I need, in order for me to agree with the author, I need to know what the author is thinking. And for that, I need to pay attention to these emotional keywords. And finally, what was the primary purpose of the entire paragraph? Why did the author write this? Was it to entertain us? Was it to convince us? Was it to do critical analysis? What was the reason? So that's very important. I'd like to encourage you to take a screenshot and you have access to the recording as well. And as you're reading from now on till your GMAT exam, try to read for structure, not for content. It may be not easy. But it's something that you can learn. It's a skill. Reading that way is a skill, just like almost anything is a skill in life. I mean, when we were born, when we were really young, we couldn't walk, we couldn't talk, but we learned how to do this. But we can do learn how to do the GMAT as well. We just need a little bit of help, a little bit of coaching, and sometimes a little bit of motivation. Now, let me give you, for motivation, let me give you an example of Alex. So Alex came into our class and said, look, I need a lot of help in math. Don't need any help with verbal. Because my verbal is 44. 44 is the top 1%. I said, OK, Alex, let's work on math. But I mean, you're going to be in the class anyway. So why don't you also focus on the verbal a bit? And notice what happened. He improved his quant from 33 to 48. So 48, the maximum score is 51 on both of these sections. But the math section is so competitive that two thirds of people get 48, 49, 50, and 51. Or actually one third of people. So it's just about the 67th percentile. So a third of everybody gets just these four scores on top. 
But for him to get a 760, he also improved his verbal, and his verbal was just off the charts. 47 is like the top 1% of the top 1%. And that helped him get a score of 760. He got into one of the schools in Toronto with a full ride scholarship. I did extremely well in a business school. Won, his team won the second place worldwide in the Economist case competition. He was actually on the back cover of the Economist magazine. I looked at this, I'm like, wow, this is Alex. This is our student. He's on the cover of the magazine of Economist. And then he, after his graduation, he got a job with a consulting firm and now he runs his own business. A complete turnaround of his career. He used to work at Best Buy selling computers. And now he's just, his career just went through the roof of the charts. And it is because he said, look, I'm, I'm going to take um, no prisoners here, right? I, I'm going to really fight for the GMAT and I'm going to get as high score as I possibly can. And even if the verbal is my strength, I'm going to improve it even further. And if the, the quant is my weakness, I'm going to work on it. By the way, there's an interesting story behind Alex. He was a musician. So he was so bad in math that the only way for him to do so well in the math section is he needed to learn all the patterns and all the strategies. Because a lot of people in the math, they rely on what they've learned in school in terms of algebra, but most of us have forgotten the algebra. So that's why many people really panic when they see these GMAT questions, because the only way that we can, we know how to do them is by using algebra, but we are no longer comfortable with algebra. But there's a better way, and the better way is to really learn the strategies. And that's exactly what we teach in our class. And that's a clear example of Alex, what helped him get a score of 760. Now, by the way, 760 is an amazing score. It's a top 1%. But do you really need that score? Maybe. A lot of our clients get 760. Some of them get higher than 760. But I see Kumio just joined, and she's going to talk about the application process and about uh, what kind of other average scores at different business schools. But I'd like to also invite you to an excellent event that is going to be, uh, it's actually going to start uh, tonight, uh, this weekend. There's an event in Toronto and an event in Montreal. And these are all virtual events, and there's going to be events in a few other cities uh, throughout the United States. And these are the events where you can go out and you can take some free workshops all about the application process. You can talk to different business schools. Uh, you can um, connect with them one-on-one. -on -one. You can ask uh, more about your story and see if uh, that specific school might be the right choice for you. So tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we're actually going to send you a VIP ticket and all you have to do is just click on register, put in your information, and uh, you can then uh, join these events. Uh, they are going to be free for you, and you can connect with these schools and take these workshops. So that brings us to kind of the final part of our GMAT class, and that is how do I prepare? What resources can I use? And then we'll talk about the application. Well, let me give you a very uh, kind of brief summary. And by the way, if you have any questions about anything that we covered today, then just please put them in a Q&A box and we'll make sure that we answer them. So where do we go from here? Well, here's how my prep works. And I, I want to give this to you just maybe to put things in the perspective so that you could see that maybe this is something that you can do as well. So what I did is when I decided to do my MBA, I, uh, the first thing I did is I took a practice test because I wanted to know what the GMAT's all about. And at that time, I did my MBA 17 years ago. At that time, uh, the re resources were fairly limited. So there were two practice tests on MBA.com, and that's all I could get. Right now, there are lots of free practice tests. In fact, I'm going to give you a link where you can get a completely free practice test, and you'll see exactly what your score is like. And you can do this from home. So my first practice test was 650. And most importantly, when I did this practice test, I realized certain things that I was lacking. And one of the things I was lacking was I wasn't really comfortable with a lot of terminology, especially in math. So surprisingly, even though I have a master's of math, my math score was lower than my verbal score because I needed to refresh my terminology in math because I learned it in a different language. And then I took the next practice test when I felt a little more comfortable with terminology and my second practice test was 700. Now, this is all I could get at that time. So I felt like I'm probably ready for the real test. I really did need above 700. And on my real test, I got 750. And the whole process took me two weeks. And I wanted to show you my official score report. 
just in case you're wondering. Everything is legit. Uh, and I'm honestly showing this not to impress you, it impresses me. I think it was really cool how I was able to do this in two weeks. Uh, but many people are coming to me and saying, Sergey, you're some sort of a genius. You've done 750 in two weeks. And my response is, absolutely not. It took me years to learn these strategies. And now that I've been a GMAT instructor for 12 years, I'm still learning. It took me even longer to learn how to teach these strategies to other people. I work with amazing people. Some of our instructors have been GMAT instructors for over 20 years. I'm still learning from them. I, it's a skill that I can develop. That's why sometimes when your friend says, I'm going to help you with the GMAT, you're really going to check their qualifications because you know, I've been doing this for 12 years and I feel like I'm still learning. But what really helped me on the GMAT was that in my middle school, in my high school, I had amazing teachers. It was my math teacher. So I feel myself incredibly lucky that I had him specifically and a couple of other people who taught me how to think outside the box, how to think differently. And that's really what the test is about. If you come to our master fresher class, I'm gonna show you. When you look at the question, like, oh my God, my head is spinning. I don't even know where to start. And then you just look at slightly different, from a slightly different perspective. And all of a sudden, that's an easy question you can do in 30 seconds. So it's all about thinking differently. That's really what the GMAT wants you to do, right? Because if you're a future leader, and we need our world needs future leaders, by the way, and you want to solve the big world problems that are big problems that our world is facing, we need to think outside the box. And uh, I want to give you a quote also from one of our recent students. Notice what she's saying. So this is a person who got from 380 to 700 in just three months, took our course, studied for seven more weeks after the course that we would normally recommend did some additional practice. And notice how she says, I learned how to think outside the box. I learned how to manage my time and stress. And ultimately I learned how to think like a CEO, which is what we teach in the, in Admit Master. We, we love analogies and we love these sorts of uh, things. So we're gonna teach you how CEOs really think. There's a set of skills, there are five skills of CEOs and we're going to tell you exactly how, as you're preparing for the GMAT, you're going to develop these skills. And everything we do is we're actually going to connect to it. By the way, the skill number one is to making good decisions. Right? So if you feel like you're not the sort of a person who is really good at making decisions, that's something you can learn. Making decisions like a muscle. You're taking your brain to the gym. And one of the things you're doing is you're getting better decision making. You're also getting better at managing your time. These are all of the skills that you can learn. So if you are the kind of person who is saying, look, I'd love to come and get some guidance. I'd love to know exactly what to do. I'd love to have the right structure. Then we would love to have you in our class. Now, our company has been around for 23 years now. And you know, I've been with with this company for about 10 years. But for the first about 10 years, 12 years, this company used to offer private tutoring, only private tutoring. So if you want some help with the GMAT, you would come in and you would be assigned a private tutor, somebody who is very experienced, maybe many years of experience. You pay about $150 an hour to meet with this person and uh, you would learn everything you need over a period of, usually several months. And the students were doing amazingly. They were getting a lot of people were getting 700 or more. There was only one problem is by the time that the instructor teaches you everything you need to know, you would probably have spent five, $10,000, sometimes more. And what we realized is that it's just not possible for many people, it's just not accessible. So what we did about 10 years ago is we designed a program that we called the all-inclusive training which essentially means that there are certain things that the instructor doesn't necessarily have to teach you one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, being in a class is a better experience because you're gonna be there with other people. So you can have, be in a study group, you can make new friends, you can see what other people are doing, learn from them as much as you learn from the content itself. So certain things, the bulk of your learning is better done in a small group. And it's just, creates for a better experience. But certain other things where you really need to get that personalized feedback, where you really need to pick up a phone call and say, I wanna to talk to my instructor. 
give me some feedback. I want to know, am I on track? Do I have the right study plan? Am I allocating enough time? What should I be paying attention to? That is something that we kept in the program. And what that allowed us to do is to say, instead of paying by the hour, which you know, runs to like $10,000, we're gonna make it a flat fee. So you can come in and get all the coaching you want, all the learning you want. You're gonna spend a lot of time in class. So there's close to 60 hours in a class. Now imagine if you pay $150 now, the instructor still has to teach you all of that. That's already $10,000. But you can learn all of that in the class. And in fact, because we have classes all the time, and because we keep our classes fairly small, you would be able to come in and retake your class completely free, all for one year. There's going to be three personal tutoring sessions included in the class. So for that, for those times where you really just have to sit down with the instructor, look into each other eye to eye and just work on a few questions, just get that personalized feedback, that is still going to be there. And if you want to pick up the call, the phone and call the instructor anytime during this time, you can do that. And in fact, with our program, if you register a little bit in advance, we're going to give you an even bigger discount. And the reason why we do this, our classes typically fill up anyway, but we'd love to encourage you to sign up in advance. That's why we offer these early bird discounts. Because before you even come to the first class, we're going to give you things to work on. We're going to give you things to prepare so you come warmed up, right? Imagine this is like a sport and you come in, when you come to a sport, when you come in to play a game, you want to be warmed up. You want to do some stretches. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And then we teach you in the class. So the class is going to be like a game. So you're going to be on, kind of like on a team, right? So we teach you things, we try things out. We have a little bit of a discussion. It's all very serious, but we're having lots, lots of fun. And then after the class, we're going to give you things to work on. So you can continue practicing and we're still there to support you. So for example, every week, there are office hours where you can come in, ask any questions. Now we do keep track of the success of our students. And by the way, there are two formats for our live classes. There's a weekend format and the evening format. And you can choose the one that's most convenient for you. And like I mentioned, you could repeat classes completely free for one year. Uh, right now, the class is virtual. We're hoping we're gonna restart classes in person soon. Uh, but uh, as of right now, if you register for a virtual class, when we restart them in person, you are welcome to come and there's not going to be any extra cost. So what we noticed is that people who really take the time to learn these strategies, they will do much better on the GMAT. Now, the average scores of our students are 670. The average score worldwide are 560. It's because most people in the world are learning theory. But if you... Want to do well, you got to learn the strategies, you got to be committed. Because look, 35% of our graduates achieve scores of 700 or more. We'd love for more people to do that, but guess what? Not everybody needs the 700. So we can help you, our commitments to help you study efficiently and reach your score within the, the, the least possible amount of time. Now we understand some of you might have five hours a week, some of you might have 20 hours a week. So that's why we're going to adapt the program to you. And the only thing we ask in return is when you come to our class, that you stay really committed to this process. Because essentially we're taking you on our team. We can think of ourselves as coaches and you come into our team and we want you to succeed. We want you to be on the Olympics. We want you to get to that dream business school. And we want you to call us and say, I just got a 760. What can I do with this amazing score? And then we want to have this discussion. So if you'd like to have this discussion then, please reach out and, uh, and we can chat and we can help you get there. So just to summarize, the live class is what is the most popular option, but there are other options as well. If you feel like you don't really need as much help and you just maybe just want to get these strategies and you're going to kind of figure things out on your own from the strategies, but if you want to have the structure you can follow, then our GMAT Express self-prep option is the option that's designed to be completely study all by yourself. It's super, super affordable. Like I, I mentioned, it's 279 for three months. And if you get it for more than, for, for 12 months, it's like comes out to about $40, $45 a month. So very, very affordable, but doesn't come with any coaching. There's a life class that as much coaching as you want and all of the life classes for a year as you want, you meet a lot of new friends, be a part of the community, get all the support that you need. And there's also an option in the middle, which essentially means that you would be taking our classes in recordings 
you are going to still have the same support, just you won't have the interaction with other people because the classes, what everybody learns live, it, with this option, you're going to be watching recordings of those same live classes. So that's another option as well, just in case, for example, you can make it to a class. Like maybe we have some people who work in shift work. So there's just no way that they can commit to being in the same schedule for six weeks. And then how long does it actually take? Now, many people ask us, well, would it take me three months? Would it take me a year? Well, typical study time, as you could see here with a live class, is about three to four months to improve. Many of our students would improve approximately 200 points. Again, it takes longer to improve more. We've had people improve more than 400 points. Uh, with the self-study option with coaching, typically it takes about five to six months. Um, and because again, people who are taking it, they're usually busier people. Uh, but some people do it really in a very compressed way. We have, we've had people who just have a month and all they do is just focus on this program. And then with the GMAT Express self-study option, uh, we see that most people are using for about six to 12 months, uh, just because it does really require a lot of commitment, a lot of dedication. And um, because there isn't really anybody there, there to ask for help, then uh, you just need to make sure that you're following the structure and you're just doing the exercises, the lots of exercises that you can do. But it could be an amazing program if you have lots of time or if you're on a strict budget, or maybe you just need a little bit of help and you can even get that platform for just a month. If you would like to get any demos of any of these options, or if you'd like to chat more about our live program, you might be this kind of a person who says, I need this, I need a good score, I know this is a good investment, and I just like to chat to see which program is right for me, then I would love to chat. I would like, love to connect with you so that I can help you make the right decisions. The decision is yours, by the way. All I can do is give you some demos, show you things, and then you can feel, yeah, this is good for me. This is good. I prefer the instructor. Or I prefer to do things on my own. So the decision is completely yours. But what I'd like to do is, if you are super committed, if you're saying, look, I really, really need this, I would like to encourage you to book your seat in our live course as soon as possible. We only ask for a $500 deposit because our classes do fill up. And we will connect with you. We'll make sure this is really the right fit for you because we don't just accept everybody in our program. Remember, when you come to a class, it's a small class. We want you to have a really good experience. Everybody is super dedicated. The word that I hear from almost everybody who comes to our class is, I'm so excited. I'm so looking forward to this class. That's what I want to hear. Right? And if you are the sort of a person, we'd love to see you in our class. If you're just exploring and you're kind of seeing, is the GMAT even for me? Come to our GMAT Master Refresher class. It is going to be in 12 days from now on Tuesday, September 28th. And you can register on our website and we'll send you a link as well. If you want to try out the practice test, you can go to jmsb.trygmat.com. This is the test that we have in partnership with the John Molson School of Business. And you can actually get access to all of these at admitmaster.com slash offer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stick around and answer all of your questions about the GMAT. If you want to chat, I will get in touch with you tomorrow. But I'd like to invite to you, uh, I'd have to in, in, invite you to hear amazing strategies from my good friend and uh, our partner, Kumio, from the John Molson School of Business at Concordia University in the beautiful Montreal, who's going to share with you some really helpful things that you need to keep in mind when you are applying to business school. So please help me welcome Kimio. Thank you so much, uh, Sergey. It's always a pleasure to be here during these sessions. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here as well. I'm just going to share my screen uh, so that you can see uh, my slides. So here we are. Uh, so I'm going to give you a few uh, quick tips and tricks uh, for admissions. And I just want to specify that the tips and tricks I'll be giving you today will be applicable really to any business school uh, that you might be applying to. So not only John Wilson School of Business, but really any business school that you might have an interest in. Um, quickly about myself, my name is Anna. You can also call me Kumi. I'm the graduate recruitment and marketing manager at Concordia University, John Wilson School of Business. 
uh, if you have any questions after this session, or if you just want to talk about your application or your profile, or you just want to have a little bit of advice on anything, let me know. Uh, please contact me via email. You can also contact me via LinkedIn. I'm also available on WeChat, on WhatsApp. So really don't hesitate to reach out. We want to be as available as possible. So you might be considering uh, your application and you're wondering how to really stand out. And the fact is, um, you know, MBA programs all over the world are really looking at very similar things. And we like to call this the holistic approach. So we like to, uh, you know, look at every aspect of the application. Yes, the GMAT is absolutely an important part of the application, and it's great that you're here to prepare for it. Uh, but beyond the GMAT, you also need to make sure that the rest of the application is competitive. So we'll be looking at uh, your academic credentials. We'll be looking at your work experience. We'll be looking at any extracurricular that you've had. Um, of course, uh, ways for us to assess your leadership potential, uh, and of course, communication skills. And finally, uh, what we uh, like to call the fit. So not only, uh, you know, how great you are for, for the school, but also how great is can the school be for your uh, career goals, for your objectives. Um, so I'm going to go over some of these uh, and, and, and see if we can, uh, you know, help you prepare for the application. So first, uh, you want to make sure that you figure out uh, the reason why you're doing an MBA. And this may seem like a very obvious piece of advice, uh, but sometimes, you know, you might not be sure why you're doing it. Maybe you like just the designation. Maybe this is something you think will open up doors for your career. Uh, now, you don't have to have a specific goal per se, uh, but it's good to have an idea more or less of where you're headed so that uh, you can plan and strategize the next two years. So, you know, figure out your current strength, figure out your situation, uh, think about the career goals that you have and how does the MBA fit uh, within uh, the next few years to make sure that you can maximize uh, your chances of getting it in admitted, but also uh, you can see, um, you know, how to prepare for, for those goals and figure out if the MBA uh, is the right one for you based on various factors. You might want to think about your budget. You might want to think about the location. You might want to think about what kind of specialties the MBA might have uh, and so on. Uh, now, uh, the second uh, piece of advice I always give candidates is to demonstrate your academic potential. Uh, so, uh, of course, the GMAT, as I mentioned, is extremely important. And if you can look at each school uh, minimum requirements as well as their average, you'll have a pretty good idea of, you know, what, what you need to at least be considered and what you need to be considered competitive. So meeting the minimum requirement is typically not enough. Uh, and we would recommend uh, students to be close to or above the average for better chances of admission. Um, and uh, the GMAT, the great thing about it is you have full control over it right now. You can, uh, you know, prepare for it and try to get the best scores possible. Uh, and that can help you offset maybe a GPA performance uh, that wasn't exactly where you wanted it to be. Maybe you had some problems when you were doing your undergrad. Maybe you were really involved in extracurricular and didn't focus on your academics. So you cannot do anything to fix that, but you can, uh, you know, improve your academic uh, credentials by having a really competitive of GMAT score. So make sure of, you know, the minimum versus the average. Uh, make sure to also highlight if you did any extracurriculars during your studies, because that's something that, uh, you know, we take into consideration. And also highlight if you have any other types of certifications, maybe you are CPA or CA, maybe you've done a few levels of the CFA or the entire CFA charter, a PMP. If you've done additional graduate certificates or diplomas, uh, this is also added value to the application. Um, and then, of course, a really important part of the application will be your resume. You're going into an MBA or a master's uh, degree. The, the, of course, we'll, we'll be looking at professionally uh, what you've achieved so far. And depending on your career goals, we'll, we'll be trying to make those links. So you want to showcase uh, professional achievements. Uh, so it's not so important, the exact you know, quantity as much as the quality of, of work experience. So work experience where you've had uh, career growth, uh, if you've had managed 
managerial opportunities, if you've had the opportunity to lead projects. Uh, these are all things you want to make sure you highlight in your resume. So we're not as interested in your, uh, you know, actual responsibilities as much as, you know, how you've impacted uh, your company. Um, and anything that demonstrates those qualities of the leadership potential, the teamwork, decision making, strategic input, you want to make sure that uh, you can highlight that with a lot of action verbs. Uh, and if you, you know, if you were a salesperson, you would talk about your sales number, uh, the impact it had on your company, your revenue. So try to quantify uh, your achievements as much as possible. Um, and of course, you know, you've had the academic achievements, you want to talk about your professional achievements, uh, but you should also highlight your personal achievements. So perhaps, you know, you've had achievements in sports and arts, uh, maybe in music. These are all things that we are interested in finding out about. Uh, maybe you're passionate about volunteering or contributing to social causes, or maybe you're an advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are all things that you want to include in your resume that tells us a little bit more about who you you are and what you stand for and uh, that adds uh, you know a, a factor that is uh, you know that we cannot quantify that is a bit different um, and same if you've started your own business uh, whether it was a successful one or a non-successful one there's something to learn from that uh, and you might want to highlight that uh, as well and, and talk about it in your narrative so uh, definitely highlight uh, as many uh, academic, professional, and personal achievements as possible to elevate yourself among a sea of, of very qualified MBA candidates. Um, uh, and of course, you'll you'll have to generally uh, submit statement of purpose or uh, essays, depending on which school you apply to. Some of them might require multiple essays. Some of them might require just one letter. Uh, try to stay within the word limit as much as possible. We try to make it a very fair process. Uh, make sure to check the spelling and the school name. So I jokingly tell candidates, uh, you know, don't copy paste your letters because even though uh, the statement of purpose may may seem like the same thing from one school and to another. Um, you know, it, it may be slightly different, so it might not feel like you've tailored the application as much, and especially if you've addressed the wrong school in your essay. Um, we also tell you, you know, be authentic, be yourself, uh, but when in doubt, try to compare it to a job application. Ultimately, we want to recruit uh, candidates that will be employable and that we will be introducing to employers that come on our campus, that we will be introducing to our alumni network, uh, who are extremely valuable stakeholders for, for the university. So you want to make sure that you always showcase yourself as a professional uh, candidate. Uh, so, you know, be yourself, express yourself, showcase who you are, but always make sure to remain professional in those interactions uh, so that you can put your best foot forward in the application. Um, uh, the another part of the application that's very important is, of course, your uh, letters of reference. So I tend to tell candidates, contact your referees ahead of time. Don't wait until the last minute because very often if there's a delay in your application processing, it's because maybe your referees didn't know or maybe they weren't prepared for it. Uh, make sure to ask someone who knows you well. Uh, sometimes we have questions about, oh, should I ask for the CEO of my company? Should I ask for that senior director? Uh, and the fact is the title for sure is impressive. If you can have a letter of a CEO or a senior manager, that's great. Uh, but if they don't know who you are, if they haven't worked with you, um, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't help us much. We want to make sure that it's someone who has worked with you, who knows you, who can really give examples of what you've been able to achieve um, and, and who can really champion you uh, into the MBA program. Sometimes we have, uh, you know, uh, candidates who will ask you to um, you know, who will uh, will write the letters for uh, the referees. And I, I tend to say you, you can help them write it, of course. It's better if they are you know passionate enough about you that they can write the whole letter for you. Uh, but if you want, you could help them write it. Uh, and I, I tend to say preferably not for all of them because generally speaking, uh, you know, you'll have a specific writing style. And it's always a little bit strange when we receive three letters that are exactly the same. Um, so, you know, make sure to let your referees know why you're applying, uh, what the timeline is, to, so that they can do a good job of preparing the letter uh, in time uh, for your application and, and, and of course showcase as many positive things about you as possible. 
um, then of course you'll come to a time when you have to do an interview for the MBA. And there are different formats of uh, interview. It could be a video interview. It could be an in-person interview uh, in non-COVID times, perhaps. Uh, it could be also like this, a Zoom interview. Uh, make sure to treat the interviews the same way that you would uh, for a job interview. That means, you know, be punctual, uh, look prepared, uh, try to be professional, uh, research the school and, and prepare questions, uh, you know, especially if it's an in-person interview. Um, and then dress the part. And I, I always jokingly say, always wear pants. If you do a Zoom interview, there's nothing more awkward for an interviewer uh, than stand in front of your underwear. Uh, it has happened to me. It has happened to multiple colleagues of mine. So uh, remember, just dress the part, be fully professional from top to bottom, and you'll avoid a lot of trouble in the future. Um, and then uh, another piece of advice, which may not be as obvious, like it's great that you're here at those sessions and we invite you to come to Ferris to meet with us. Uh, make sure to uh, connect with the school. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a large financial and time commitment to do an MBA. So you wanna make sure that you have as much information as possible and that, uh, you know, they get to know you as well. Uh, so make valuable use of the admissions team time. I always say, you know, don't ask for questions that you could find easily on the website. Uh, if you only have 20 minutes with us, make sure that you want to ask about things that you can't find out so easily so about the environment about the alumni network about uh, you know job prospects things like that um, connect with alumni and with current students whenever possible to make sure that you know you can get a good feel of what the experience is like and to see if you see yourself doing an MBA for the next year or the next two years um, at this at this school specifically and then take the process seriously with all the school uh, we are aware that you're shopping around maybe you're going to multiple schools and that's completely fine uh, but again uh, the most important thing is to always be a professional at all time and that implies you know in your interaction with the schools as well and and this is surprisingly something that uh, you know we, we pay attention to very closely so a little bit of shameless promotion for the John Molson MBA program. We're top five in Canada uh, overall, a number four and two major rankings, Bloomberg Business Week and The Economist. Uh, we're also top three in Canada for return on investment, a so number one, two out of three years, uh, but a QS rankings. And we are known as the number one uh, in Can um, MBA in Canada for entrepreneurship uh, by The Economist and Princeton Review. Um, I... I don't want to tell you too much about John Molson. If you're interested, I invite you to join me at an info session. But uh, if you were to consider uh, to do a John Molson MBA, there's a few reasons. One, we're extremely personalized and flexible. So it's a small class size, but access to a wide network. Uh, you know, at one given time in our MBA, we have about 300 students, but in, in uh, class sizes of about 40 to 45 students uh, and very flexible schedule, morning, afternoon, evening. Um, we offer a case-based MBA, so uh, access to real world experience, experiential electives, and community, uh, community initiatives. And we offer, again, a, an excellent return on investment. So we offer a very affordable tuition. If you uh, look at our tuition as a Canadian student, it's approximately $6,500 for Quebec residents and about $14,000 for Canadian, uh, Canadian non-Quebec. Uh, and international students pay only approximately 42,000 Canadian dollars. Uh, so definitely a, a very affordable MBA compared to our top five counterparts. Um, and we have a high uh, employment rate post-graduation. Our peak year was 97% a few years ago. Uh, now our three-year rate is 91% within three months. Uh, of course, COVID has affected things, but we are confident things will pick up uh, very soon. And of course, very competitive base salaries similar to other top Canadian schools. So if you're interested in finding out more about the MBA, contact me via email at gradadvisor.gemsb.concordia.ca. I can send you an on-demand MBA or webinar, or you can come to a live session. We have another tips and tricks session coming up September 22nd, where we'll be elaborating a little bit more about all the points that I mentioned today. Uh, or if you're thinking about doing an MBA uh, while pursuing your CFA charter, you love finance, uh, come to our MBA CFA info session on September 23rd. So I'm going to give it back to Sergey. I'll put my contact information in the chat, uh, and I'll stick around as, as well if you have a few questions questions really don't hesitate that's what we're here for get in touch with as many schools and as many representatives as you can to make sure that you know you're ready for the right MBA that will be the best fit for you so thank you so much for, for listening thank you so much Kimio for sharing these tips uh, I always love to hear your tips and uh, ladies and gentlemen I, 
I hope you're seeing that this is really the process that could be scary, could be intimidating. However, there's lots of information available. There are lots of people who are willing to help. And I just wish for you to make the right decisions. So if you connect with us, we can't make these decisions for you. So all we can do is share with you a few ideas, share with you a few stories so that you can decide what's best for you. Now, I honestly don't know how, how important it is for you to do an MBA, how it's going to affect your career. All I know that statistically people with an MBA make between three to $8 million more than people with a bachelor's degree over the next 30 years of their career. So it is, there's definitely a clear return on investment. I mean, with the John Moses School of Business, it's, it's hard to beat the return on investment, especially if you live in Quebec for $6,500. Uh, but the decision is really yours. And all we are here for is to help you make that right decision. So please connect with us. Uh, I've uh, posted my email address. And thanks, Kimio, for posting yours as well. We are going to follow up with you by email tomorrow so that we can share some of these resources with you. I will also post here a link of where you can find these resources that I mentioned. Uh, and um, if you go to this link, you're going to find the free practice test. You're going to see uh, different demos of different classes. So you can actually try out these uh, programs that I mentioned. You can see which one you like the most, and then we can connect and I can help you all get started. If you have any questions at this time, please throw them either in the chat box or in a Q&A box. We can stick around for a couple of minutes or as long as we need to, if you have a lot of questions. If you don't, then uh, that just probably means we did a good job, Kimo, tonight to uh, preempting all of your questions. And in that case, we can let you go. So any questions, any last minute, hey, Kimo, hey, Sergey, questions? I guess we did do a really good job explaining everything. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to let you go. We, are, we have been recording this seminar. We are going to share the recording with you. You have access to it for about seven days. And if there's anybody you want to share the recording with, then please feel free to send them a link uh, so that they can watch this recording as well.